Blade Runner 2049 is an aspirationally smart movie, not a smart movie. So I was looking around YouTube and it recommended the cyberpunk documentary to me. And uh, it was made a few months ago. I think that's how it works, is you're some poor, talented asshole and you make something really good on YouTube. And then uh, you just sit around wondering why it's not getting the views, of course, it deserves to get. But eventually, I guess, the algorithm sometimes catches up. And it recommended the cyberpunk documentary to me. And uh, it got me interested in cyberpunk. I, I don't know, it was so good. And I was just like, oh, where can I find more cyberpunk stuff? Which there's not really that much uh, sort of meta on cyberpunk to be found for free online, I guess, of any quality. But it also got me thinking then about the like seminal uh, cyberpunk pieces of media. And Blade Runner is definitely one of those few pieces of media that really got cyberpunk started. And also, with that comes Blade Runner 2049. It's, uh, you know, nostalgia bait sequel that was supposed to equal the pretentiousness and, you know, cinema prestige of the original. And of course it did not. It it uh, pretty much failed financially and uh, it wasn't it wasn't a very good movie, although it is the kind of movie that people violently defend online. And the, the first thing they'll, they'll bring up is, you know, it's so smart. Oh, it's such a smart movie. Oh, people don't get it. Oh, you know, oh, I lament that such a great, intelligent blockbuster uh, got ignored by the, by the pablum-loving crowds of mouth breathers who go to cinemas today. But the, the problem with Blade Runner 2049 is that it's not a smart movie. It's, it's not even really a little bit of a smart movie. You could do a full Mr. Plankett-style breakdown of the ways the plot is actually dumb. And that's, that's number one. How are you going to say you wrote a smart movie when a smart person watches it and they go, you know, a lot of this, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't follow. It doesn't work. And, and you're, you weren't smart enough to write a smart script, but your movie's got some genius philosophy behind it. Some, some genius philosophy behind it. Some, some incredible, you know, depthful exploration of the human condition like but your, your plot wasn't cohesive and it didn't really make sense and the characters weren't motivated properly and your scenes were poorly constructed yeah it, it doesn't work like that it doesn't work like that if you're that's it when you watch when you watch movies when you watch great films you'll notice the plots you know if it's a smart movie they tend to have some kind of at least internal consistency it's not just a lol whatever. And Blade Runner 49 has a very much lol whatever plot with Jared Leto doing what he does for absolutely no reason. None of, none of it, none of it follows. None of it works. None of it makes sense. But so what? But so what? Lots of movies are stupid. Blade Runner 2049, though, what it is, and this is why it gets the, the, the people who love it, this is why they love it, it's an aspirationally smart film. And, and what I mean by that is for people who are almost smart, they're so close that it's, 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 uh, it becomes defining for them. Trying to be smart, trying to get over that line, becomes a, a, a keystone of their entire existence. Uh, imagine, as a metaphor, uh, basketball. If you were a good enough basketball player to be a starter on like a Division I basketball team in college, your desire to get into the NBA and, and play in the NBA is, is uh, magnitudes greater than my desire to get into the NBA and play, right? Because I've never played basketball. So I, and I'm certainly not good enough to play at any level. At any level, I'm, you don't even want me on your pickup team, right? I don't, I don't play basketball. I don't know anything. And I'm sure I wouldn't be good at it if I tried. The point is, the fact that you're, you're so close, right? If you're uh, just a mediocre intelligence, you're just 100 IQ, all right, you'd like to be smart, but it's like, you know, it's whatever. There's no frustration. It's not just out of reach. It's way, way out of reach. So there's no point in worrying about it. If you're, if you're just that borderline smart, you're so close to being smart. It, it drives you crazy, right? It drives you, oh, 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 you could just accept it, you, but you can't accept it. You can't accept that you're not quite smart because you're so close. Your fingertips are on smartness. I'm reaching out right now to pretend that I am this almost smart person, almost reaching smartness. And that's where 
that's where Blade Runner 2049 comes in. It's this kind of movie that pretends to be smart. And so you can enjoy it if you're almost smart and pretending to be smart. That's its value. And fans of it will bring up like, oh no, it's got like deeper philosophical themes. And I thought one of the, the, the main things I saw, someone writing about it, uh, I've seen it m multiple times, and people saying like, oh, well, you know, it asks like, what, is it, what does it mean to be a replicant? You know, what, what is the difference between a replicant and a human? And so the main point of, that I'm having this conversation with you is, is a real quick look at what are great literary questions. And Blade Runner 2049 um, is an example of what a not smart piece of art does with great life questions or great literary questions. It asks the question, what does it mean to be a replicant? Or, and they said, what does it mean to be a replicant, which is super bad. But let's suppose that it actually asked, what does it mean to be a human? We'll give it credit it doesn't deserve here, but let's suppose it was a little bit better and it asked, what does it mean to be a human? Well, the, the, the reason that's not in any way impressive whatsoever is that at the start of your movie uh, an Orson Welles look-alike could come up on the screen fade from black onto him and he looks right in the goddamn camera and he goes what does it mean to be a human what is it what does it mean to be a replicant what's the difference between human and replicant and then you fade back down to black and then the actual plot of your movie begins and you know what your movie has successfully asked, what does it mean to be a human or a replicant or the difference? Wow. Wow. So impressive that you ask that. You see why that's not impressive? You see why that's, that's actually pretty uh, dumb? The, the movie asks what it means to be a replicant. Oh, okay. Why not just say that out loud? Now you've successfully asked what it means to be a replicant. You don't understand art at a very high level if you haven't quite crossed that bridge yet. It's not impressive to ask a question. It's impressive to provide answers to these unanswerable questions. I'm going to bring in Shakespeare here. In Henry V, uh, there's a lot... The play is about war. The play is about war, nationalism, war, and... Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't just ask the question. Well, is war good? You know, should we be doing war? Well, oh, applause, applause from the dummies. No, applause from the almost smart people, right? Ra ra raucous, round of applause. You successfully asked a question. Boy, that was a difficult question, and you asked it. Wow, way to go! It only took you three hours of poorly written plot structure, and you successfully asked a question. Wow! No, in Shakespeare and Henry V. What it does is it provides you what is, in fact, an unanswerable question about warfare. You know, going to war. War is hell, but do we need to go war, the topic of? Should we be doing it? Is it good? Is it bad? And then he provides you five or six answers, right, from different perspectives of different people. And there's a great verisimilitude within those answers because there are actual there were actual historical figures in his time and through today and actual people living now who uh, would give you these answers to that question from their perspective and you and what makes it so valuable is a that these are uh, kind of worthwhile answers these aren't just dumb answers you know these are five or six intelligent reasonable reasoned or at least reasonable. Uh, uh, answers from when you consider perspective, you know, temperament, personality, emotion, you know, a, a human being's real way of thinking. If you consider all that, these are very worthwhile uh, uh, perspectives. It's providing you a perspective. It's, it doesn't say, oh, war, is that good? I don't know. Orson Welles comes up, hey, is war good? Fade to black. Oh, wow, what a great movie, right? No, you have to provide answers and then the how well you do, uh, the job you do providing those answers, the depth you do providing those answers, is, is actually the content of the unanswerable question within your movie. That is the literary content. That is the human condition content. That is the, that is the high art value of your movie, is in those answers and how well a job you do giving them and conveying them. Right? How many you provide, how well a job, how good a job you do uh, providing them and making them clear to the audience so that they can empathize with that viewpoint, with that answer to an unanswerable question. 
that's what the artistic merit comes from. Asking a question is, again, honestly, and this is something, if, if you go, wow, I was really impressed by that movie, it asks, what does it mean to be human? And I go, okay, I made a, I made a YouTube film uh, where the camera pops up, and I go, uh, what does it mean to be human? And then it goes away, and then that's the end of the film. Isn't my film just as good as the film you're sitting there gushing over? Well, by your metrics, yes, it is, because it asked a question about what does it mean to be human? And it saved you a lot of time, too, right? That's not impressive, and smart people know that's not impressive. People who are almost smart don't. That's why it's aspirational. It's a, if you're smart, you want to get some answers to unanswerable questions. If you're not smart, what, what good does that do you? What good does Shakespeare do you if you're almost smart? What good does that do you? You're not following along. What good, what good does it do to you to provide you information your brain more or less can't play with? It can't use. Oh, here's a perspective on, on war. Like, okay, I've heard it, but I, you know, I don't really know how to break it down. I don't, I don't know how that game is played. I don't know. I, I get these toys inside my, my mind, but I don't know how they're used. So it's just worthless to me. That's Shakespeare to an almost smart person, right? So... If you write, for God's sakes, if you write and you want to write something smart, yes, you must wrestle with unanswerable questions, but you need to provide answers to those unanswerable questions and, and within that realize that you are necessarily succeeding and failing in the act of trying to answer an unanswerable question. And this is something uh, SJWs get wrong. This is why comics are bad nowadays. This is why a lot of modern stuff, even not with the SJWs for the last 30, 40 years, has been uh, artistically poor. It's because they try, they ask a question and then they answer it for you. Like, you know, they provide some moral quandary and then they just go, well, here's how it is. That's that. That's just you giving your stupid opinion, right? That's not, should, is divorce wrong? Yes. No. Maybe. Right? That's, okay, you could just, again, just ask the question out loud yourself like I just did and then just give your answer. You don't have to make people sit through two or three hours worth of some bad play for you to tell them that you think blah, blah, blah is blah, blah, blah. Okay, I, just say it. You know, I don't need a two-hour, three-hour long play. I don't need to pay $65 to go hear you metaphorically tell me that over 180 minutes. Okay? Anyways, uh, back. My actual second point. The end of the actual second point, moving on to point two, is I started to get into this already, where it's like it, Blade Runner 2049, as, as some of its fans have said, well, like, it asks, what does it mean to be a replicant? What does it mean to be K? What it, here's the problem with what does it mean to be a replicant. Unanswerable, great literary questions are unanswerable questions, and they're unanswerable questions about the world, as in the real world, as in the world we live in, as in fictional worlds don't inherently matter and aren't inherently important. And, uh, you know, I can walk up to the line here of kind of insulting uh, genre fans in this, and I'm, I'm not trying to do that, understand, but I am saying, you know, what does it mean to be a replicant doesn't matter because replicants aren't real and even more importantly the world where replicants exist isn't real right blade runner creates a it's all of its kind of stolen it's kind of cribbed from the real world but it creates a literally fictional earth a fictional version of the human race uh, this fictional version of the human race creates biological androids which is another a lot of science fiction writers they took some physics but they didn't pass biology 101 biological android Woo! Awful, awful, awful stupid concepts of these biological androids. I watch so many bad science fiction with the android. Oh, the human android is a biological... Oh my god. You can, o you can only do biological androids if you literally don't understand sixth grade biology. Most of it's so breezy. It's so bad. It's so bad. Anyways, a fictional, a fictional Earth, a fictional human race, and they've fictionally created a group of fictional robots who are fictional. And they've created a fictional policy and some fictional laws and, and, and uh, you know, deputize some fictional police officers to go enforce those laws against these replicants. Who cares? Who ca None of those things are philosophically important, right? Now you can say, okay, the point of sci-fi is to provide a, a cogent metaphor to things we face. Fair enough. Great point, actually. When you begin asking, what does it mean to be a replicant, you are doing none of that. Replicants aren't real. And, uh, I mean, you could, you could say, oh, someday we'll have, ro we'll have, you know, Rosie the Robot servants, and what will we do? Okay, okay, that's a rather tortured, uh, 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 you know, 
concern troll of, of philosophy, but, but at the end of the day, replicants aren't real. The people who mistreat replicants aren't real. The mistreatment of replicants aren't real. These are not great questions. And, and uh, I'm going to bring it back to graphic novels. When we talk about deconstructing like the, the superhero, when we talk about deconstructing the superhero, you know, Superman isn't real. Batman isn't real. Now, the impression we have of Superman and Batman and what they may mean to people is real, but Superman isn't real. So when you kind of deconstruct Superman, uh, that's not a great literary question. When you deconstruct the superhero, which is a thing which does not exist and never will exist, uh, you have not asked a great literary question. And for your work to kind of not really matter beyond those who are just gigantic fans of the subject matter and the genre, it comes as no surprise then that these works which are trying to philosophize about, you know, within genre, in genre, just navel-gazing within a genre, that these works really don't matter to most of the world because they shouldn't matter. They don't ask great unanswerable questions about the human condition. They ask genre questions about a genre. Again, it's, it's like... The Rogue One thing, where it's like, oh, it's awesome, they're going to war, it's like a war, oh my god, so serious, like, <laughs> it's not a good movie, it's just, it's just, it's sort of masturbatorily enjoyable for the people who enjoy that m film franchise, it's not deep. So, if you're going to make kind of great literature here, and I'm not saying you have to, uh, but if you want to, one thing, you can't, you can't take a Blade Runner 2049 approach and ask questions which don't matter because they're not real and trying to connect them to the real world is, is rather pathetically strained at best. That's what you don't want. You don't, you don't want to write Blade Runner 2049. You don't want to be an aspirationally smart, stupid film, which is what it is. All right. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. I'll see you next time. I'll see you next time.